Hello everybody and welcome back. This is the third and final part in the West Memphis 3 case. The trial of Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. began in January of 1994. The decision was made to try Jesse separately from Damien and Jason, and at first I couldn't understand why they would decide to try them separately, but as the case and the trial went on, it became more clear to me. According to the published report, Miss Kelly told police he watched 18-year-old Damien Eccles and 16-year-old Jason Baldwin brutalize the children with a club and a knife. During Jesse's trial, it became pretty evident that the only real evidence they had against him was his confession. They had no DNA and understand this is 1993 when the crime happens. DNA testing is in its infancy, so it's very, very basic. It's not anything like what it is today. So they didn't have any DNA tying him to the scene. They had nothing against him besides his own confession. Had confessed because of his low IQ, because he just wanted to go home. He wanted to take care of the immediate stress factor. He wasn't thinking ahead. Warren D. Holmes, an expert on police interrogation techniques who had worked on the JFK assassination and the Martin Luther King Jr. murder, he said that an individual like Jesse would say anything to get out of the police station that night and that he thought he could sort it out later. He points out that Jesse's confession stems directly off of questions the police are asking him. That should have been a, uh, a signal that something was radically wrong. That's when uh, the question should have been more probing to determine whether or not he was making it up or giving a valid confession. Which we kind of did go over in part two of the series. And if you haven't seen part two, I will link it in the description box, but I suggest you watch part one and part two obviously before you watch part three. He also said it was highly unlikely that Jesse would have gotten so many details wrong if he had actually been there. He wouldn't have gotten the apparatus used to tie up the victims wrong. He wouldn't have gotten the times so drastically wrong. Dr. Richard Ofshi, an expert on false confessions, testified and highlighted again that the fact that Jesse's timeline and facts from the crime scene had basically been built for him. It is directly suggested to Jesse that the correct answer is this happened at night. Immediately upon that being suggested, Jesse is, responds by accepting, and now he starts to use the word at night, where he had never used it before. That is an influence tactic. It is a way of getting someone to accept something out of pressure and out of suggestion. The prosecution then tries to discredit this witness by asking him, Dr. Ofshi, do you only get paid if you state an opinion that is expressly connected to the people who are paying you? And he was like, no, I don't. I get paid to give my expert testimony, which I'm giving. And then they asked him, well, how do you like explain the fact that he knew one of the boys was cut on their face when that hadn't been previously released to the public? Dr. Oaf, she says, I can't explain that because you guys talked to him for hours before you turned the tape recorder on. So there's no telling what you let him know or what you disclosed to him before you turned the tape recorder on. In closing statements, the prosecutor holds up a picture of Michael Moore. Because of what Jesse and Miss Kelly Jr. did, Michael Moore's dead, Stevie Branch is dead, and Chris Byers is dead. He also says to the jury, look at him, he can't even look you in the eye. He's not even making eye contact. Jesse later says he was upset about this. It bothered him that the prosecution would say that because he had been told by his lawyers to look down, to not make eye contact, to probably to be respectful. How come he always keeps his head down? Well, we don't because I was told to keep my head That's down. That's right. Yeah. On February 4th, 1994, Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. was found guilty of first degree murder in the death of Michael Moore and second degree murder in the deaths of Chris Byers and Stevie Branch. He is sentenced to life in prison plus 40 years. Now, not only did Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. confess to the police, he also confessed to his own lawyers, and he confessed to the police in the police car after his trial when they were driving him to jail. A lot of people take this to mean that he's guilty. He confessed multiple times. But once again, this is a, a teenager with a low IQ. This is a scared teenager. When he confessed to his lawyer, he claims that he didn't know his lawyer was working for him. He basically just thought he was another cop, that it hadn't been thoroughly explained to him. 
Finally, his father, Jesse Miss Kelly Sr., says to him, son, these people are working for you. They're trying to help you, so you need to be honest. And that is when Jesse actually told his lawyer, I didn't do this. I didn't know you were my lawyer. I thought you were just another cop. And I was just telling the same story. In the police car on the way to jail, he had already been sentenced to life in prison. And the police claim, why would he confess again to this when he'd already been sentenced and he could have been just saying, I am I'm innocent. I didn't do this. The story goes, and nobody knows besides Jesse and the police that were in the car, the story goes, Jesse said that they told him if he told them the whole story again, they would bring his girlfriend to see him in jail. And they also said, you've already confessed against Damien and Jason, and they haven't even gone on trial yet. So if they aren't found guilty, they're probably gonna hurt your family and your girlfriend because you've already testified against them. So they basically threatened him and scared him, according to Jesse. My personal opinion is he doesn't have the creativity to make a story like that up. Now it's time for the trial of Damian Eccles and Jason Baldwin. So right when the trials are first starting, the prosecution, the lawyers, they go to the families of Michael Moore, Stevie Branch, and Chris Byers, and they say, listen, we need Jesse, Ms. Kelly Jr., to give his testimony in the trial against Damien and Jason. We need it. So they actually admitted on camera in this HBO documentary that they didn't have a lot of evidence against these guys. They had some girls who were at a softball game and said they heard Damien confess to the crimes. They had some fibers that had been taken off the victim's bodies. They had a knife found in a lake behind Jason Baldwin's house that wasn't even the murder weapon. They didn't have shit. So the prosecution tells the families, we need him. And in order to use his testimony against his friends, we have to probably offer him a deal. They offered him a reduced sentence to testify against the other two boys. And in the end, he went back and forth about it, but Jesse decided not to testify against Damien and Jason. He said he didn't want to lie anymore, that it had just gone too far. Let's talk about the fibers that they found on the victims that they tied back to the homes of Jason and Damien. Now this evidence ended up being so vague. Some of you have asked me in the first two videos, why does it seem like all the sources you're using are kind of pro West Memphis 3. And the reason for that is a lot of the websites and media that were involved with going against the West Memphis 3, saying that they were guilty, it's all like speculation, it's not science, it's not fact. Now these fibers that the anti-West Memphis 3 people will hold on to, I believe these fibers could be found in any single person's home in the United States who shopped in Walmart at that time because that's pretty much what it was. They found a red fiber on one of the bodies of the boys and that fiber was also found in Jason Baldwin's trailer but it was found on his mother's bathrobe and they found a green fiber on another one of the boys and that was found in Damien Eccles trailer in a couple places one of them being on his stepbrother's granimals shirt. So it's the stuff you buy at Walmart and everybody who lived in that town would have had access to the same clothes. The these are generic red and green fibers that would be found on any piece of clothing that would be purchased from Walmart, or you could find it. You could go into Walmart right now and find those fibers. Maybe not the exact same ones because it's, you know, so many years later, but that's what I'm saying is they were so generic. They could have taken those fibers and found them in anybody's home in West Memphis, Arkansas at that time. I mean, it certainly wasn't a smoking gun and they didn't have any DNA evidence to connect the three teenagers to the three eight-year-old boys at Robin Hood Hills that day. The Baldwin Eccles trial began on January 28th, 1994. At Damien and Jason's trial, the prosecution brought up a expert witness, Dr. Dale Griffiths, an occult expert, and he testified about a lot of things. He testified about the look of a Satanist. They will paint their hair black, wear black clothing, paint their nails black. He's asked if there are occult undertones to these murders, and he says, yes, I do believe that there are occult undertones to these murders. Griffith says the date that the boys were murdered was close to a few occult holidays, and also that there was a full moon the night of the murders, which was typical that they would use the full moon to do their 
satanic rituals. He goes on to talk about the life force of blood, which is a common theme in many occult books. He holds up Damien's journal, which has a Wiccan pentagram drawn on it with some upside down crosses near the pentagram, and he says this is clearly a mixture of Wiccan and satanic beliefs. There's also a bunch of passages underlined in red, you know, certain notes being made, and Damien would go on to say that he got that book from the library, one of those sales where books aren't, aren't really being checked out a lot, so they sell them for 25 cents or 75 cents, and he bought it from the library one day, and all those passages were already underlined, and there was already notes made in them, and he thinks somebody used it to do a school project. Damien's lawyer basically goes on to expose this occult expert as a mail order PhD. He asks him what classes did he take to obtain his master's degree or his PhD, and the guy gets super nervous. He's like, what, what? I'll play you a clip. How, how were you accepted into enrollment at Columbia Pacific University? I had to fill out a uh, considerable series of papers, including all my education, background, experience. Did you ever fill out a little flyer like this? No, sir. That says, call toll free for information on how to become a doctor? This is a mail order college, isn't it? What classes did you take between 1980 and 1982 to obtain your master's degree? What, cl what classes? I testified. I'm asking, yeah. what classes? What classes did you I, take? I told you, I answered that before, none. You did not take any classes. Between 1982 and 1984, when you became a PhD, what classes did you take? Now, I'm not discounting Griffiths as an intelligent person. I'm not even saying he didn't do extensive research into Satanism and the occult. He was a retired police officer, and he said he became interested in cults when he witnessed the college riots in the 60s. I'm not sure what one thing has to do with the other, and I'm pretty sure that the riots were just college students protesting against the Vietnam War, but I could be wrong. Anyways, I'm sure he wasn't a stupid person. I'm sure he was a person put on the stand by the prosecution to elicit fear in the hearts of the 12 people who would be deciding Damien and Jason's fate, and it worked. There was a lot of places I also thought he was reaching, you know, trying to make the details of the crime fit into this satanic package. Judge Burnett asks him if the number three is significant in Satanism and the occult, and Griffiths says, well, the number of the beast is 666, but some people believe the Beast wrote six as three. I did some research into this, and according to CuttingEdge.com, this is what I found out about the number three. Three is the first sacred number, the first perfect number. Three represents the pagan trinity. It is represented geometrically in the triangle and spiritually as the third eye of Hinduism. Occultists will multiply and add three to other sacred numbers to create new numbers. However, occultists have used 333 as the hidden symbol by which they present the more offensive number 666. Okay, fair enough. The number three does have some significance to the occult. But when you look at the testimony of the teenagers who heard Damien confess at the softball game saying he had killed the three boys, he was gonna kill two more before he turned himself in and he already had one picked out, then you have to ask yourself, you know, well, that's five now, that's five. And I looked into it and the number five has nothing to do with Satanism or the occult. So where's your logic here? If you're saying three is important to Satanism, that's why they killed three boys. Well, why are they killing two more boys, which makes five boys unless they're doing it in separate rituals, I don't know. I'm not I'm not a, an occult expert. The prosecution's witnesses besides Dale Griffiths were some of the police officers who had interviewed Damien, also Deanna Holcomb, which was Damien's ex-girlfriend, and she testified to the fact that when she and Damien dated, he would carry a knife around, and also that he and Jason would be talking sometimes, and she would walk up, and they would stop talking. Now this is riveting testimony. A teenage boy carried a pocket knife around and when he was talking to his friend and his girlfriend walked up, he'd stop talking. 
super sus. I don't know about you, when I was in high school and my boyfriend was talking to his friends, when I walked up, he stopped talking, but probably not because they were talking about the devil, probably because they were talking about other girls. Michael Carson, a known drug addict who had been in jail with Jason after Jason had been arrested, he testified that Jason confessed to him. He claims that after a couple times of just hanging out with Jason, Jason eventually spilled the beans and just released everything, told him everything. And he goes into some really gruesome details. It's pretty messed up, but a counselor who had worked with Carson came forward doubting the legitimacy of his statement, not only because he was known to be on drugs all the time, but because he could remember discussing the details of the case with Carson in one of their counseling sessions before Carson came forward. Years later, Michael Carson would come forward and say he had made everything up, none of it was true, and he knows that Jason will probably never forgive him, but he's sorry anyways. They also put the teenage girls who had heard Damien confess to the murders on the stand. Basically what we have here is hearsay, gossip, and a guy who got his PhD in the mail and read some books so he thought he was an expert on the occult. Damien then takes the stand in his own defense and he talks about Wicca, his interest in it, its basic concepts. They hand him his journal and they ask him to read aloud some of the handwritten quotes that he wrote in the journal and he does and then they ask him well, what does it mean and he says well this is a William Shakespeare quote and this is a a song lyric from Metallica, and it's talking about injustice in the legal system in the US, which I thought was really funny, especially the way he says it. It's funny. Life is but a walking shadow. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. That's from A Midsummer Night's Dream by William Shakespeare. Um, pure black looking clear. My work is soon done here. Try getting back from me that which used to be. That is off a Metallica tape called Injustice for All. It talks about how warped the court systems are, and stuff like that. On May the 5th, did you... Then something a little interesting and what appeared to have been incriminating popped up, and that's the Aleister Crowley connection. Aleister Crowley was a well-known English occultist. Many refer to him as a Satanist, though he never accepted that term. He did not believe in the Christian religion. He couldn't worship somebody who was created by the Christian religion. Now I'm aware I'm gonna get hate from people who truly believe that Aleister Crowley was like an evil man, but I don't know if he was or wasn't. But I'm a facts person and I'm also a history buff and I think we're too advanced as a culture at this point to let fear and misinformation rule our decisions. Aleister Crowley was a practitioner of magic in his own words and he called himself the Beast 666. He was not very well received in life. People thought he was weird, but after his death, he became an important cult figure. There's not enough time in this video to talk about his life, his religious beliefs, his political views. I can do another video on Aleister Crowley if you're interested an actual factual and historically based video. But essentially, he became a figure to a new generation of young people long after his death that represented a search for spirituality and connection outside of Christianity. He's never been proved to have killed or sacrificed anyone, even though people will read his books and interpret his words as meaning that he did, but he never has been proven to have done that. I mean, could he have killed and sacrificed people? Sure, but there's no proof to say that he has. He had some outrageous beliefs. He'd been prescribed heroin for a medical condition. That was pretty common back in the day to be prescribed heroin as medicine. So he was probably on drugs like all the time. And he was probably like a strange dude who had beliefs that went outside the mainstream at that time. So they hand Damien a list of names that he had written using a coded alphabet of some kind. And they ask him when he wrote this list of names. And he says, I don't know, sometime before I got arrested, I Pose. And they're like, you sure you didn't do it after you were arrested? And he's like, yeah, pretty sure, but I don't know. It's been a long time. And the prosecutor was like, well, can you read me these names that are in this alphabet that's coded? What names are on the list? And he was like, well, there's my name, Jason's name, my son's name, and Aleister Crowley. And then, you know, everybody's like, what? And the prosecutor at that point, he's like, well, you must have written this after you were in prison because your son wasn't born until after you'd already been arrested but you have his name on this list. So you wrote this while you were in prison. You wrote Aleister Crowley's name while you were in prison. Now I have a couple problems with this. One, Damien would have known the name of his son before his son was born. Typically you pick out the name of a child before that child is born, right? 
it, it's possible he knew what they were going to name his son before his son was born. Two, who cares? Who cares what he wrote on a list of names and if Aleister Crowley's name was on there? Who cares? It doesn't state that he's a murderer. This is my problem with this whole trial is they're assassinating his character based on his religious or spiritual beliefs. No evidence whatsoever that he was connected to these boys at all. Jason Baldwin was also offered a plea deal if he would testify against Damien. They offered him 40 years with the possibility of parole after 15. 40 years. That's a pretty sweet deal for someone who if found guilty is probably going to get a life sentence if not the death penalty so he turns it down he says my mother raised me not to lie my mother raised me to tell the truth and i'm not gonna lie and ruin somebody else's life to save my own i think that's a pretty big sign that they didn't do it and i also think it's a pretty big sign that jason didn't think damien even did it and if the prosecution thought that Jason Baldwin had taken part in these murders like they said they did. They're offering a man who killed and mutilated three little boys 40 years in prison with the possibility of parole after 15. Like, did they actually think he did it or did they just want to get Damien? I don't think I would have been strong enough in that situation to stick to my morals the way Jason had, especially at 16. So I give him a lot of credit for that, a lot. The jury comes back on March 18th, 1994 and brings with them a verdict that puts Jason Baldwin in prison for life, puts Damien Eccles on death row. In 1996, the HBO documentary Paradise Lost premiered. It brought public awareness to a small town legal battle that normally would have been swept under the rug and nobody would have ever heard about it. If not for this documentary, nobody would have really heard Stevie, Chris, and Michael's story. Nobody would have heard Damien, Jesse, and Jason's story. It just would have been a small town triple homicide. They caught the culprit, put him in jail, put Damien to death. It would have been over with. People began to get involved all over the country. They saw three innocent teenagers who reminded them of themselves. It scared people to death because they thought, I wear black t-shirts. I like to listen to Metallica. I like to read Stephen King. Well, if this can happen to these three kids, it can happen to anybody. Celebrities like Johnny Depp, Eddie Vedder of Pearl Jam, Natalie Maines of the Dixie Chicks, they raised funds and awareness for the West Memphis Three's plight. Websites were built, concerts were held, more documentaries were made, books were written. It became like a phenomenon. Many people characterized themselves as outsiders. Many people characterized themselves as not fitting in to mainstream and people rallied behind these three boys. Now in the midst of the whole media circus that this trial and case eventually became, I do believe that the actual victims were lost in this. There's so much on Damien, Jesse, and Jason I could find on the internet, but not a lot of information that I could find about Stevie Branch, Chris Byers, and Michael Moore. And that kind of bothers me because even if the West Memphis Three, their lives were ruined if they were innocent and they were put in jail, Stevie, Chris, and Michael's lives were taken from them. And it seemed like people had kind of forgotten that in the end. In 2007, when better DNA testing had come into play, a hair that was found in the shoelaces that were tying Michael Moore was tested and it didn't match any of the three men that had currently been sitting in prison for the crime. However, it was consistent with the hair of Terry Hobbs, who was Stevie Branch's stepfather. Now when I say consistent, that's because they didn't actually have the root of the hair, they only had the hair shaft, so they couldn't actually do DNA testing on it, they could only match it to like hair type. But it was something that showed that there was something found at this crime scene that didn't match any of the three people who had been convicted of this crime, but did match somebody who barely had been questioned about this crime. One to ten, how solid do you think the case is? Eleven. <laughs> so in June of 2007, Terry's actually kind of talked to by the police department. And, you know, at that point, it's pretty clear that his alibi 
and his whereabouts the night of their disappearance were patchy at best, but nothing ever happened with that. Natalie Maines of the Dixie Chicks says at this concert at one point, like, you know, free the West Memphis Three. There's more DNA to tie Terry Hobbs to this crime than there are to tie Damien, Jesse, or Jason to this crime, and Terry Hobbs gets pissed and sues her for defamation and, you know, loss of wages because Nobody's hiring him. I think he thought he was gonna get rich. I think he thought that this was his payday, like he was going after the Dixie Chicks. He was gonna get paid out and then live off of, you know, the unfortunate death of his stepson for the rest of his life. But the opposite happened. He actually didn't win his suit. He had to pay for her legal fees. And because of him bringing the suit against Natalie Maines, he was now able to be openly questioned in court about his involvement in the murder of Stevie Branch, Michael Moore, and Chris Byers. We'll talk about that in a minute too. Forensic pathologist Vincent DeMeo is asked to look at the autopsy report to see if there's anything that Peretti, the medical examiner who had done the autopsies, had missed. He discovers, in his expert opinion, as well as others who have supported him, that the marks found on the boys, the scraping marks, the bite marks, as well as the genital mutilation of Chris Byers, these were all found to be done by wild animals, especially snapping turtles. The alligator snapping turtle is very common in that area, and there would have been a lot of them in the creek where the boys were found. <laughs> Okay, I'm not gonna touch the turtle. He missed the wood, this is bad. Where the jaws scissored through my skin. Wow, and the crushing power was insane. Did the dowel rod, dowel rod was ineffective. It didn't help at all. <laughs> it missed the dowel rod. So Peretti, the medical examiner at the time of the boy's deaths, when he did the autopsies, he basically just didn't know what he was talking about, in my opinion. Don't come for me, that's my opinion. I don't think he knew what he was talking about. And they found that most all of the marks on the boys' bodies were made by wild animals, which is quite common, especially considering they were in that water for a, a long time. Because of new evidence, because of public outcry, there's now talk of the West Memphis Three getting a new trial. And the current regime in West Memphis, the police, the lawyers, the judge, they didn't really want to have anything to do with that. The judge who initially heard the cases, David Burnett, he turns down every single appeal these kids file every single one. He even postponed a run for state senate so he could continue to sit on the bench and turn down all these appeals. And at one point, they even asked him to recuse himself from this case because he was clearly like emotionally invested in it and he turned that down as well. For 18 years, he denied every appeal that came his way. And, and he bothers me a little bit because I don't believe he was impartial at all. There's times when you were watching the trial and he just looks bored. He kind of looks like he's already made up his mind and he doesn't even know why we're here, why are we doing this. After he makes a statement that he should have never allowed cameras in that courtroom. And it's a pretty telling statement to me. Like, yeah, you didn't want people to see what you guys were doing, but you were so cocky, you thought you had this on lock, that you invited cameras in the courtroom to even witness it because you were so sure. And now you regret doing that because it shined a light on the backwards way of doing things that you guys had in your legal system in West Memphis at that time. And it made you look bad. So I'm sure you regret letting cameras into the courtroom. He even said something during Dale Griffiths' testimony in the first trial that, I don't know, really bugged me when the defense attorney was like, well, are you really, you know, allowed to be called an expert? You got your degree through the mail, you didn't even have to take any classes, and they try to dismiss him as an expert witness because of this, and the judge says verbatim, I'm not sure in Arkansas or any other state that you have to have any degree to be an expert in a particular field. If you can demonstrate knowledge, education, experience, and training in the field, you could have a third grade education. If you have other education, experience, and training that qualify you as an expert. So I'm not persuaded at all by your argument of a mail order PhD. Is there anything else? You could have a third grade education and be an expert witness at somebody's trial, which might end up sending them to prison or put them on death row. Oh, okay. In 2007, Damien's new lawyers hold a press conference at the University of Arkansas in Little Rock to discuss the new evidence in this case, and they bring with them a litany of actual evidence and actual experts. 
Werner Spitz, we've seen him before. He worked a little bit on the Jan Bonnet Ramsey case, and he was considered at that time to be the country's leading forensic pathologist. Richard Souvran, who was a forensic odontologist, so a bite mark expert, and he was actually integral in helping the FBI put away Ted Bundy, so he helped on that case. Tom Fedor, DNA expert, and John Douglas, who headed the criminal analysis unit at the FBI for 25 years. So these are a group of people who know what they're talking about. Like, this is their life, they live, they breathe it, they know what they're talking about. In 2001, Arkansas passed a statute that allowed previously convicted individuals to now contest their convictions based on DNA evidence that could now be actually processed and looked into. Not one piece of DNA evidence at the crime scene connected Damian Eccles, Jason Baldwin, or Jesse Miskelly to that crime scene. These are three teenage boys. Do we really believe that they would have known how to clean up after themselves so thoroughly to not have left a trace behind, not one trace? In 1993, a big part of the case against the three boys was that they had taken part in satanic rituals and the condition of Chris, Stevie, and Michael's bodies showed that they were used in some satanic rituals. Dale Griffiths even testified and said the removal of the genitals was a big in Satanism. Like, that's what they did. It was really common. Medical examiner Peretti showed abrasions that he said were made with a serrated knife, specifically a survival knife, such as the one found in the lake behind Jason Baldwin's home. The prosecution claimed the knife belonged to Damien and he had used it in the murder, but it was known by the police that that knife had been in that lake for a year. It was thrown in the lake a year before by Jason's mother who didn't want him to have knives. And she told the police that she had thrown the knife in the lake and the police were like, well, let's go in this lake and get this knife because this proves that they killed people. And they actually called the press and were like, go to this lake because we're gonna find something big. And that's how they knew to be there when the knife was found, even though the divers were only in the lake for a very short time because they knew exactly what they were looking for and where they were looking for it because the police had already told them. So the diver comes up with the knife and you see this picture of the diver with the knife in front of him and the press just got that picture. It was perfect. It was incriminating. It looked bad for Jason and Damien and that's what the police wanted. But this knife was not even used in the murders. It has no evidence of being used in the murders and the marks on the boys' bodies weren't even made by a knife. They were made on wild animals using their claws to bring the bodies closer to them. Yet, medical examiner Peretti claimed the knife found in Jason's lake, or the lake behind Jason's house, was consistent with the wounds on the three bodies. Jury misconduct was also brought up in the 1993 case. A lawyer, Lloyd Warford, he signed an affidavit saying that the jury foreman had inside knowledge, or knowledge he shouldn't have had, about Jesse and Ms. Kelly's confession that he brought to the jury and they used it when considering the fate of Damien and Jason, which they shouldn't have been able to do since Jesse hadn't testified against them. His statement is sealed and he can't discuss it due to attorney-client privilege, but his law clerk, Gina Reynolds, was more than happy to discuss what happened. Kent Arnold was the jury foreman on Damien and Jason's trial, and he had actually hired Lloyd as a lawyer for his brother in a different matter altogether, but he would often call and talk to Lloyd about certain things, including the trial. When he hired Lloyd for his brother's case, he already knew he was potentially going to be on the jury for this trial, and he wasn't shy about talking about all he'd read, about Jesse Miskelly's confession, about how he thought they were all guilty of sin and they should go away for life. At one point, she hears Arnold on the phone with Lloyd saying, okay, I got my jury summons, like how do I make sure that I get on this jury? And Lloyd responded to him, I mean, you're pretty clear in how you feel about this. Don't worry, they're never going to like put you on the jury. She remembers when Arnold got on the jury, Lloyd was like, how did you do that? And Arnold replied, stupid lawyers and stupid judges. They don't ask specific questions. Kent Arnold continued to call Lloyd and discuss the case with him. He asked about Jesse's confession. He asked when they were gonna play it at trial because he knew it existed. And when he found out they weren't going to, he took it upon himself to bring it to the jury's attention. And they know that he did this because the jury would make notes 
the pros and cons about each person, why they thought they were guilty, why they thought they weren't. And under the why we think they're guilty place, they wrote Jesse Miss Kelly's confession. And it was crossed out on the bigger paper, which they would put up front so everybody could take notes off of that. But they found it on jury's specific separate notes. So Kent Arnold knew he wasn't supposed to talk about the confession. It wasn't supposed to be in there. And that's why he ended up crossing it out on the bigger paper up front. But he still brought it in because he thought it was his job to override the legal system and serve justice as he deemed it to be served. This is clear to me, this is why they wanted to try Jesse separately from Jason and Damien because they wanted his confession to reach the jury whether he decided to testify or not. They wanted all the gossip and the rumors to be spreading around and taint the jury pool, which it did. Let's talk about the suspects besides the West Memphis Three. And the first one is John Mark Byers. Byers was very outlandish and vocal during the first trial. He's quite a character. He made me laugh a lot, and I know that wasn't the point. I know he was like an upset father, but his personality in general is just really like out there. He really missed his calling. Like he would have been perfect on reality television. He just has that kind of magnetism about him. He's just a fun guy to watch. He was very passionate in his beliefs, also contradictory in some places. In one breath, he would be singing gospel in the church. There's a voice calling me from an old rugged tree and it whispers draw closer to me and the next he was shooting with his gun they just let me line in three son of a guns up i'd say this one here's for you jesse and we're gonna go for the jug of water oh jesse i done blowed you half and two son <laughs> now, this one here's for you damien you that black circle right in the middle oh you got hurt <laughs> hey jason <laughs> I want you to smile and blow me a kiss for this one. And, you know, setting fire to their pretend graves that he made, it was just ridiculous. I understand that some people are just really passionate about their beliefs, but people thought he seemed to be a little strange, and this made him suspicious to some people. During the second Paradise Lost documentary, Damien and his lawyers strongly suggested John Mark Byers was involved in the three boys' deaths. Aaron allegedly named him in his initial interview and said that he didn't like Chris and he didn't like kids to begin with. He was very vocal, like I already said, during the trial, whereas the other parents kind of kept to themselves and seemed more like grieving parents and less like they were playing for the cameras. He has a history of physical abuse. He has a history of drug use. He was like a police informant at one point. He was a drug dealer at one point. He and his wife, Melissa, were in some legal troubles from robbing their neighbors at one point. There was just a lot going on with John Mark Byers. Additionally, Chris Byers was the only boy who was killed before he was put into the water and he had the castration. So they thought, you know, he was the one that had kind of been abused the most. So it might suggest that maybe John Mark Byers wanted to kill Chris. The other two boys saw, and he just kind of got rid of them as collateral damage. There's also some shadiness about his wife, Melissa Byers' death in 1996. He claims he woke up next to her, and he went to go get a drink, and he asked her if she wanted a drink as well, and she wasn't responsive, so he went to her and kind of shook her, like, are you there? Wake up. And this when she started throwing up. He called his friend who he told to call an ambulance. Finally, the ambulance gets there and takes her away and she ends up dying. And on her death certificate, it says inconclusive or unknown. Like we don't know why she died. There were some drugs found in her system, but not enough to be believed to have killed her. But John Mark Byer said he wanted an autopsy done. He signed the permission to have an autopsy done. He was cooperative. He didn't really like keep anything hidden. It did come to light that he was dating somebody else at the time. So he had a different girlfriend at the time. So he was cheating on her and they had been having some marital problems. She had been living with her parents for a little while, but none of that really says that he killed her. Did he kill her? I don't know. There's no proof. And if we know anything about how the West Memphis PD works, there never will be because they probably didn't do a really great job of looking into all avenues of possibility for her death. A lot of people think because he was Chris's stepfather that this would make him not like Chris because that's a step-parent, step-kid thing sometimes. But you have to understand, Melissa Byers was pregnant with Chris 
when she met Jan Mark and he had basically raised him since birth. Basically, I mean, he did. He didn't basically, he did. He raised him since birth. So it wasn't as if she met Jan Mark Byers when she already had a four or five year old kid. He looked at him like his son. I really think he looked at him like his own son. And of course, he abusive, yes. Did he probably go a little hard on Chris? Yes, but it doesn't mean he didn't care for him and it doesn't mean he wasn't devastated when he was killed. Also, he's accounted for the entire day of the disappearances. And to me, that's the most important thing. Everything else is speculation. He has alibis, he's accounted for, he's never really alone during the evening and he actually was like upset about the fact that there was no police presence. He called the sheriff's department and complained that they hadn't sent enough people out to look for his son. He was always communicative with the police, with the other parents. He was out there looking and I don't think he did it. However, during the filming of Paradise Lost, John Mark Byers did gift the documentary makers a knife and they saw what they believed to be blood in the screw part of the knife, you know, the part you might not clean if you were cleaning the knife off. They gave it to the police, the police tested it, and there was found to be human blood on it. The blood was tested and it was discovered to be the blood type of Chris Byers, but it's also the blood type of John Mark Byers, so they shared the same blood type. When John Mark was asked initially, had he ever cut himself on the knife, he said no, but then later he said, I don't know, I could have. I was cutting deer meat with it. I might have cut myself. I don't remember, but it's possible. That was a big thing for a while. Like people thought for sure he was involved because of the knife and the blood. John Mark Byers also worked for the police department as a police informant for a little while, so a lot of people think that he had an in with the police, that maybe he could have had things covered up, but you know what? He was always cooperative. He was always open about his non-involvement in the deaths of the three boys and he actually took a polygraph which he passed so he's been really cooperative like i said i don't think he did it once the dna evidence began to show that there was no link to the west memphis three and the deaths of the boys john mark byers actually began to support the West Memphis Three. He actually received a letter from Damien while well, Damien was still in jail, and Damien said, I'm sorry that we did that to you. What we did to you was the same thing that everybody did to us, basically accusing somebody on what they look like or how they act instead of actually looking at evidence, and I will forever be sorry. I hope you can accept my apology. John Mark Byers actually supports them now and still says to this day that he doesn't believe it was the West Memphis Three, who he does believe it was was Terry Hobbs. Terry Hobbs was born in northern Arkansas. His father was in the military and he became a butcher and went on to open 30 restaurants which is crazy that's a lot of restaurants like his father I think had a lot of money for a little while. He was brought up really strict no TV no sports hardcore religion worked in the slaughterhouse butchering animals for his father's restaurant for a while. He dropped out of school in the 10th grade and he was married once before he married Pam Hobbs and he had another child from that marriage Ryan. Now his first wife does say that he was physically abusive to her. Terry and Pam were having issues in their marriage before Stevie even died. They would spend some time apart from time to time and two weeks after Stevie's death, Terry would move out of the house and spend some time in Hardy, Arkansas, which was about 120 miles away from West Memphis and that's where he was when the police came to question him or to question Pam and he was never questioned in the murders because he was not around when they came around asking questions. In November of 1994, Terry and Pam were having an argument as they often did. Terry hit Pam. Pam called her family upset, told them what happened, and Jamie Hicks Jr., her brother, came over to, I don't know, beat Terry up or scare him or whatever, but they get into a fight and Terry ends up shooting Pam's brother in the stomach. Now he survives this, but he later dies from complications due from a follow-up surgery from the, the bullet wound or the gunshot wound initially. So Pam's family always blamed Terry for their son's death. And they also think he was involved with the death of their grandson, Stevie Branch. In 2003, Terry Hobbs was arrested on drug charges. He was also accused multiple times of abusing his daughter, Amanda. 
Amanda Hobbs is also a mess till this day. There's so many lives that were affected by these murders and this case in general, but she's in therapy. She's trying to work through her hidden memories. She's trying to work through the things that she thinks happened or knows happened, and she's a mess. It's pretty sad. In 2005, Pam took a restraining order out on him. They were divorced, and his name was removed from Stevie Branch's tombstone. Besides his hair, or hair that was consistent with his, found at the crime scene, there's a lot of other reasons people think he did it. First of all, Jamie Ballard saw the boys riding back towards Terry right before they went missing. He was the last person to be seen with them. Also, Stevie's aunt, Jo Lynn, stated that Terry Hobbs repeatedly sexually molested his daughter, Amanda. She stated that he used cocaine, crystal meth, and marijuana. She was also at the Hobbs house on the day of May 6th, and she said she saw Terry washing clothes and bedding and cleaning Stevie's room. And she was surprised by this because Terry had never done a load of laundry or cleaned a room in his life. And he was in Stevie's room with like bleach, wiping everything down. He was washing the bedding. He was washing a bunch of clothes. So she thought that was suspicious. She said he was also taking clothes out of the dresser drawers and washing those as well. Sheila Hicks, Stevie's aunt, says that Terry was heavily physically abusive to Stevie that he would make him hold his hands over his head so he could beat him and he would leave marks on him all the time but never any place where it would show. She said Terry used to make Stevie play a game called Dead Cockroach where he'd have to lay on his back with his legs and his arms up and when he got tired and tried to lower them, Terry would beat him. A woman named Sharon Nelson, who was Terry Hobbs' girlfriend, says that he claimed he found the bodies before the police did, but he left them there because he didn't want to be considered as a suspect. And you also have his friend, David Jacoby, saying that he was never with him in the woods searching that night, even though Terry Hobbs has used him as an alibi. Mildred French, a woman who lived in his apartment building in the 1980s, they were neighbors, she says that he was pretty much crazy. Number one, she thinks he killed her cat. Number two, while she was in her bathroom one day having a bath, he came in and was like, shh, and put his hands on her chest. And then when she started screaming and freaking out, he ran out afraid the neighbors were gonna hear. So charges were filed on him and he had to go to counseling and he dismisses this as being ancient history. Also, he says he didn't, he didn't kill the cat. She thinks he did. Stevie's pocket knife is also a main thing that caused especially Pam Hobbs to suspect Terry. Now Stevie had a pocket knife that was given to him by his grandfather, the same grandfather who gave him the bike. It was very important to him. He loved that pocket knife. He had it on him all the time. He wouldn't leave the house without it. When Stevie's body was found, he didn't have the pocket knife on him. And Pam kind of thought that was weird, but just assumed it had gotten lost or something. And she ended up years later finding the pocket knife in Terry Hobbs's lockbox. And when it was brought to his attention by the police asking him, why did you have this pocket knife? He said, well, you know, I just didn't think my son should have a knife, so I took it away from him. Pam Hobbs insists that she saw Stevie with that pocket knife just the day before he had gone missing. So unless Terry had taken it from him that day, she doesn't think that's a true story. Pam Hobbs also now supports the West Memphis Three and doesn't believe that they had anything to do with the murder of her son. Pam Hobbs thinks that Terry was jealous of her and Stevie's relationship. He would get upset if she were to lay down with Stevie at night because Stevie was scared at night and wanted her to lay with him and he would get jealous and resentful. And he even told his mother like, you know, she doesn't give me as much attention as she gives that kid. He just didn't like Stevie and was jealous of the attention Stevie got from his mother, which is warped. Terry Hobbs has refused to take a polygraph and has refused to willingly give any DNA evidence. Terry Hobbs claims to have been with Regina Meeks that night in the woods, but she says he was not. There's so much that points to Terry as somebody who could have been involved in this. It's kind of hard not to suspect him, but at the same time, we don't know. We don't know if he did it. There was a couple teenage boys that the police question in relation to these murders, Chris Morgan and Brian Holland. Now, Chris Morgan and Brian Holland were just some local teenagers. They'd gotten in trouble with law before for some drug charges, but you know, normal, normal teenagers. And they were actually suspected because they left West Memphis a couple days after the murders 
and went to California. The local police were alerted in Oceanside, California, and they picked them up and interrogated them for several hours. And you know, you know, normal police tactics. Just keep banging on these kids until they tell you what you wanna hear. I suppose they were interested in them because of their abrupt departure from West Memphis so soon after the murders. Also, Chris Morgan drove an ice cream truck around the neighborhood. He was a neighbor of Stevie Branch, had been to his house, knew his family, and would have been familiar with the other boys because of his ice cream truck route. The Oceanside Police Department brings these kids in, they give them polygraphs, and then they interrogate them for like 12 hours after, telling them that they lied on the polygraph and they failed. And these kids are like agitated, and I watch these interviews Chris Morgan does act weird. He gets up on a chair and he's like yelling and he ends up confessing to the murder, but only after hours and hours and hours of being pushed and told he's lying. And that's what they keep doing to these kids. Like they keep telling them, you're lying, you're lying. We know you're lying. The boys are like, we're not lying. What are you talking about? And finally, Chris Morgan gets up on the chair and he's like, what do you want me to say? That I killed them? Okay, I did. Maybe I blacked out and I killed them. So he actually confesses to the murders, but he was never even actually read his rights or anything before they interrogated them and gave them polygraphs. So I don't even know if it can be considered a legitimate confession. But I also think there's a young man in there who's confused. I believe that. About it. Do you want to know why I'm confused? Yes. Please. I found out the little boy's dying. You know, um, you know, I do all the stuff sure. that I have to do. Okay. You know, I get ready to go. I'm out of my right, I'm out of my town to get down here in California. I'm oh. finally gonna get here. So in California, all of a sudden, you know, I gotta come down to the station. I'm a suspect for murder. Mm -hmm. You know, what the hell could be more confusing? Mm -hmm. What could scare the shit out of me more than that? Mm -hmm. If I were on the run Okay. My parents wouldn't know where I was going. Mm -hmm. Sure they would. You know how I know that? Honestly? Yeah, because you love them. Deep down inside, you love them. Man, you might not like them, but I you would, love them. I would, if I killed somebody, I would not tell anybody where I was going. Why? Because that's just a way to get caught, okay? So Chris Morgan makes some good points in his interview, right? If I killed somebody, why would I run away but tell my parents where I was going? If I killed somebody, I wouldn't tell anybody where I was going. And they just keep trying to like screw with his mind. Like when he admits and he says, maybe I blacked out and I did it. You can literally see the officer, like he's like happy about it. You know, he's like, oh, I got something. They're gonna be so proud of me. Like I got this kid to confess. Oh no shit. I mean, I don't know anything else. Mm -hmm. I told you all I could. Told you, you told me what you wanted me to hear. I agree with that. I told you what I know. Okay, and I'm not asking the same six questions over and over again. Okay? Well, you're going to end up doing it anyway. No, no, no. I mean, I, you, you failed. Okay? The polygraph, the examiner told me, I said, what is your position with this young man? Mm -hmm. He says, he failed. Maybe it's a friend. Okay? Maybe, maybe it is you. Or maybe uh, I freaked out and blacked out and went and killed three little boys. Maybe that's possible. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe you find out. Hey, look, I'm, I'm just saying, maybe you do. Do you have hypnotists? Uh, I don't know. Not right now. Can you get one? I have never, ever asked. I've never had to get one. Well, do you think maybe you had a vodka? I'm, I'm, there's no telling. I you could have. There's no telling what happened. That is possible. Well, right. give me a hypnotist. I'll, okay. I'll, I'm going to go through every possible way. Okay, let's sit down for me. Okay. Okay. You know what? You just brought a very interesting thought up. Okay? Okay. Seriously, and, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to get... So maybe what is there? Maybe you did black out. Maybe. 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 Do you have an alcohol problem? No, I don't drink. Okay. Is it possible you could you could have done it? No. It's not possible at all. And he's like, oh yeah, sit down. Maybe you did black out. Maybe, you know, that happens sometimes. And we understand. And he's like doing everything, pulling every trick out of his bag to get this kid to confess. And after he says all that, Chris is like, no, I didn't do it. Why did they take Jesse Miss Kelly's confession so seriously, but they did not take Chris Morgan's confession seriously? Then they interview Brian Holland, who was his friend also from West Memphis. What else do you want to know? I just want to know the truth, man. That's it. But I think, look. You think I know something yeah. about it? Uh, okay. I'm just, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to help you understand right. the way things are, are maybe refocusing. Okay. All right. I mean, you don't need these big changes in your life. We're talking about potential life in prison here. Okay. Let me explain something. This is the problem. Okay. You're smarter than that. I can see it. It's written on you. Mm -hmm. Okay. The only people in the problem is the suspect and the three victims. Okay? 
Everybody else outside is a witness. Okay? All right. Until they do one thing, they start lying. When somebody lies, they automatically step into the problem, and that's called PC 32. Accessory after the fact. If you want to step into this circle, which has a potential life penalty without the possibility of parole, okay, or 25 to life, does Arkansas have the death penalty? Um, I don't either. Okay. I know California does. Because what webs we weave, okay? We weave webs because we don't tell the truth. What? Whatever the problem is. There is no problem other than the fact that I'm here, I'm hungry, this is ridiculous. Okay, well, there's more to it when you sit on the machine, okay, and you come up almost carbon copy okay, to the exact same questions as the other guy. So they did the, the circle thing on him too that they did to Jesse. Do you want to be inside the circle with the bad people who are going to go to jail or do you want to be outside the circle with us? It must be a tactic written in the How to Scare the Crap Out of Teenagers Police Interrogation Handbook. The kid even says he's hungry at one time and the cop's like, okay, but you're lying. And he was just telling him that he's lying and then he starts talking about weaving webs and all this garbage and they wonder why these kids were like fed up. They're like, we came to California for a vacation to hang out and we're sitting at the police station answering questions about murders we know nothing about. Damien, Jason, and Jesse were in prison for 18 years, with Damien spending most of that time in solitary confinement on death row. Their appeals are being constantly denied and the situation's looking dire, but when the new DNA evidence comes out, the Supreme Court can no longer hide behind the previous trial. It can no longer deny that something needs to be done, so they grant the West Memphis Three a new trial. The Alford plea was actually brought up by Damien's defense team, who brought it to the state and was like, let's talk about this. So basically, an Alford plea, if you're not familiar, it's a guilty plea while maintaining your innocence. So if you ever saw the staircase on Netflix, the Michael Peterson case, where he's put on trial for killing his wife, Kathleen Peterson, he took an Alford plea. So he said, I'm innocent, but it's in my best interest to plead guilty to this, but he's maintaining his innocence. So that is what Damien's attorney brought up to the state of Arkansas. And at this point, there's a whole new cast of characters in play. There's new DAs, new lawyers, new judges, new everything. So they're not emotionally attached to this case in the way that the others were. They're not like gung-ho on seeing these kids spend their lives behind bars. And they're open to it, but they say, you know, it has to be all three. They all three have to agree to it or we can't make a deal. Damien agrees, Jesse agrees, but Jason Baldwin holds out. He's like, I didn't do this. I'd rather go to trial get my innocence and leave jail with that. Then say I'm guilty and have that hanging over my head for the rest of my life. So at first it appeared like they weren't gonna get the plea because Jason was holding out. He really didn't want to be looked at as a guilty man, which also says something about his innocence to me. But eventually he caved in and he said, I'm not certain enough or confident enough in the legal system at this point to risk and play games and gamble with the lives of Jesse and Damien. If it was just me, I would have done it. I would have gone through with the trial, but I don't have any faith in this legal system and I don't want to mess with their lives, so let's take it. I know I get a lot of comments saying that I spent more attention and focused on the research that favored the West Memphis Three, but as I said, I like facts. I like dealing with cold, hard facts, DNA, alibis, things like that, and most of the research and websites and work done by those who think the West Memphis Three are guilty are really based on emotion and religion and feeling that because they were proven devil worshippers that they killed these boys. I've read a lot done by William Ramsey and I think he's a very intelligent guy and I respect him a lot, but it's all usually focusing on well, they actually do worship the devil and they actually do believe in this stuff, so they must have done it. Being a Satanist, being pagan, being a person who believes in the occult, being a person who even follows Aleister Crowley, it doesn't make you a murderer. I know lots of people who practice Wicca. I know lots of people who are agnostic or believe in certain 
rituals and things like that that aren't religious, but they're spiritual. I know lots of people like that. Some are good, some are assholes. So all of these other sources basically just focus on like, they were Satanists, so they did this. They will literally go on and on and on about proving Damien's connection to the occult. And I don't care, it's just not enough. Even if he's a proved Satanist, even if he got matching tattoos with Johnny Depp of a black son, even if he knew every word Aleister Crowley had ever written by heart, it doesn't mean that he killed those boys. It doesn't mean any of them killed those boys. They didn't know them, they had no motive, they had no connection, and a small child is more likely to be killed by somebody they know and somebody they don't know. No matter what you believe, no matter which way you're leaning, we have a court system in this country for a reason. To avoid putting people in jail who are innocent and to avoid letting people who are guilty walk free. Does the system fail us? Yes. Are there people in jail who shouldn't be? Yes. Are there people walking free who shouldn't be? Yes, but it's the best we can do. You need to be proven guilty beyond the benefit of a doubt before you're put in prison for a crime. There is no way, as an intelligent person, you can say that there was enough evidence beyond a shadow of a doubt to say that Damien, Jason, and Jesse killed Michael Moore, Stevie Branch, and Chris Byers. There's not enough evidence. Even the lawyers for the prosecution didn't think they had enough in Damien's trial, and that's why they were trying so hard to get Jesse's testimony put in there, because they wanted to keep influencing the jury to be afraid of Satanism, to be afraid of people who were different than them, to be afraid of the unknown. That's what that trial was based on, and in 1993 and 1994, it shouldn't have happened. Being interested in the occult, owning a pack of tarot cards, reading Stephen King novels, wearing a black t-shirt, does not make you a murderer. It was not enough evidence. They never should have gone to jail for that. And if the state really thought that they were guilty, they should have done their job better and got more evidence and actually did a thorough investigation. Like, hey, Regina Meeks, go find the Bojangles guy. Where'd the Bojangles guy go? Nobody knows. Bojangles guy never found, never found. There would be more evidence to put Bojangles dude into jail than they had to put Damien, Jason, and Jesse in jail. But there we are. While Damien was in prison, a young architect from New York City named Lori Davis actually saw um, Paradise Lost and she felt compelled to write to him and they began a correspondence. On December 3rd of 1999, they were married in a Buddhist ceremony while Damien was still in prison. Lori Davis eventually moved to Arkansas to be closer to Damien to help on his case and she was a big proponent and like a big reason of why things went so quickly. When he was released, they moved to New York City where they stayed in the Tribeca area for a little while before they bought a house in Salem, Massachusetts. A little wink and a nod to the Salem witch trials, which these people who believe he's guilty use as a reason to show he's guilty. I think it's just irony and a little bit of humor. I believe they moved back to New York City since, but I'm not quite sure. He currently runs his own business and speaks out against wrongful convictions regularly. Jason Baldwin also got married and he lives with his wife in Portland, Oregon. He wants to go to school and study law and get a law degree, although he cannot legally practice law while this conviction still hangs over his head. And Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. in normal Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. form, he moved back to West Memphis, Arkansas and he stays out of the limelight, stays out of the press, doesn't like to talk to anybody, keeps to himself. Let's do a little where are they now on Jerry Driver. So Jerry Driver actually got in trouble with the law for writing $27,000 in unauthorized checks and he was placed on probation by Judge Burnett, the same judge who wouldn't hear any appeals from the West Memphis Threes. And then he actually went to jail in Florida for felony grand theft charges and was on probation there until he died in 2016. That was so sad, like I'm making fun of him and then I say he died, but you know, he, he did obviously end up passing away. And in the years leading up to his death, he was just kind of regularly in trouble with the law for this or that. So he was no longer a probation officer at that point, obviously, I would hope, but in Arkansas, you never know. So that's it guys. I don't know if you think it's a happy ending. They got out of jail, but they still have this conviction hanging over their heads forever. It's a sad story. Three eight-year-old boys who had their whole lives ahead of them lost their lives and in what appears to be a really vicious way. Anybody could have done this. It could have been somebody they knew. It could have been somebody who was passing through town, just hanging out at one of the truck stops. 
could have been anybody. And because the police didn't look into it well enough initially, we probably will never know who the true culprit is. But we need to remember that Stevie, Michael, and Chris were beautiful, happy little boys. They were very loved by a lot of people. They were very important to a lot of people. And I don't believe Melissa Byers ever got over the death of her son. And I believe that's why she turned to drugs and eventually it became her downfall. Pam Hobbs was obviously destroyed by the death of Stevie. And Michael Moore's parents, Don and Todd, I, I've, I think they still believe that the West Memphis Three are responsible for this. So they will obviously never get over that. Hey guys, I'm gonna end it here. It's been a long enough video. I hope you enjoyed this series. Stay kind and stay beautiful and I will see you next time. Bye.